Hi, I am Dr. Montgomery, and this is Simony. And tonight, we are going to talk to you about a group of angiosperms called the eudicots. You can see in the background of this slide some examples of eudicots. Some of these we'll talk about, like the raspberry. Others we will not talk about, like the blueberries. But they belong to this group as well. So we'll start by talking about general characteristics of this group. And this will be material you're familiar with because it is the opposite characteristics of what we said the monocots show. We will then talk about three families that are all within the eudicot group. These are going to include the poppy family, which diverged fairly early, the rose family, which is in one of the two large sets of families, and the carrot family, um, which is a family with edible as well as toxic members, and this is within the other large group of eudicot families. And we've looked at this so many times now, so just a quick reminder that we've already gone through the entire history of plants from the algae up through the bryophytes, then to the plants with um, dominant uh, sporophyte generations like the lycopods, and the ferns, and we've been talking about gymnosperms, and more recently, angiosperms. Within the angiosperms, we divided it up more. And remember, we said in the angiosperms, that's everything above this point on the phylogeny, um, we said there were some groups that diverged early, like the water lilies, magnolias, and laurels. And then later, there was a split between this large group of monocots and this even larger group of eudicots. The eudicots are going to include something like three-fourths or so of all of the angiosperm species. So it's an incredibly diverse group. Within the eudicots, we're going to talk about one group down here that diverged fairly early, and this is going to be the poppy family. Then we're going to talk about one family on this branch, that's the rose family, and one family on this branch. This is going to be the carrot family. There are literally hundreds of other families I could have chosen to talk about. So this is a really small sampling of the diversity within the uh, eudicot clade. So eudicots are the dicot group that split with the monocots. It's everything in orange starting right here these are ancestral species. The ones that are around today are right up here at the tips. Um, and the reason we use the term eudicots is that the very early diverging angiosperms are sometimes also called dicots. And the term eudicot is more specific only to the angiosperms that occurred after the split with monocots. So it's easier to see this in the picture. Um, historically, things down here, like the magnolias and laurels, would have been called dicots, even though they are not especially close relatives to this group up here. So when we use the term eudicots, we're referring only to this group of close relatives to each other, and we are not talking about these early angiosperms that used to be called dicots. The eudicots are the most diverse group of angiosperms. That means it's really hard to generalize about which traits they share, because there's so much diversity that there's very few traits that applies to all of them. But there are some traits that most of them have, and those are the ones that we will talk about in the subsequent slides. First, remember that we said the monocots have this scattered structure of vascular bundles in their stems. They're not forming one concentric circle. The dicots tend to have one concentric circle of vascular bundles. And we've talked about the fact that this allows the dicots to form true wood, mm -hmm. while the monocots cannot typically expand um, their stems in a way that would form true wood. Another difference is that eudicot roots tend to form from the embryonic root. Remember that for monocots, we said that the embryonic root dies 
and the, its adventitious roots that form a fibrous root system. Instead here what we see is that the embryonic root continues to grow, it eventually thickens over time with lateral growth, and it forms this taproot. Um, so most eudicots would do this. Eudicots have two cotyledons in their seeds. We saw this in the picture of a generic seed I showed you when we were just talking about seeds, but in fact that was a eudicot type seed. Remember the monocots have only one cotyledon, as shown here. The dicots have two, and dicot literally means die for two and cot short for cotyledons. Remember that cotyledons are embryonic leaves. And just to remind you down here, we've got the embryonic stem and the embryonic root. This is what will eventually form our taproot. So I'm going to fix this to say eudicots. Common features of the eudicots are that they frequently have four or five petals. Out of those two numbers, five is more common. So this is a strawberry flower, and we'll look at this soon. We'll see that strawberries are a member of the rose family. You can see very clearly there are five petals. There's also um, fewer groups, but still several, that have four petals instead. So for example, this is rapeseed, um, which is the plant that gives us canola oil for cooking, and it is a member of the uh, mustard family. All mustards have four petals, um, as shown here. Remember we said that monocots have parallel veins. In contrast, most eudicots have reticulate, or um, we'll call them netted veins, as shown here, where so-called because the veins form a net-like appearance. So those are traits that tend to be in common with the eudicots. We are now going to diverge from that, and we are going to focus on just a few groups that we've already mentioned of eudicots, rather than try to do a very broad general survey. So that first group I said we would talk about are the poppies. And this is one of the first groups of eudicots to have evolved. As such, some of its traits are more similar to the basal angiosperms than they are to most other eudicots. Um, the buttercups are another member of early diverging eudicots, and the poppies and buttercups have a lot in common. One thing they have in common is they tend to have many anthers, um, which you can see here. There's maybe 15 or 20 anthers pictured. The poppy family is not huge. It's got less than a thousand species. The family is not large. It's important because we use it for gardening, uh, because the flowers are attractive. We use it as a source of food. We use it for pharmaceuticals. And of course, it is also used for illegal narcotics, um, which we will talk about um, at the end of this section. So the member of this group that we are going to spend the most time talking about is the opium poppy, um, whose scientific name is Papaver somniferum. We'll talk about the significance of that name momentarily. This one species is interesting because we use this one species for every different use of, of the family as a whole. Uh, so one thing that we use the family for is for gardening, and that's true for this species. As you can see here, it has an attractive flower, um, and so it's commonly planted. In many places, it is legal to grow um, for this purpose so long as the latex is not harvested to um, make narcotics. And many, or at least some varieties that are used for cultivation have very little um, chemicals in them that would be useful to make narcotics. And so it's a relatively safe plant to have. That said, uh, laws do vary in different regions. And so it's probably worth checking to make sure that you're allowed to have this plant. Um, before you get in trouble. Um, let's look at some characteristics of the opium poppy, 
Just like we saw with that California poppy, you can see that there are many anthers here. That's a characteristic of the um, family. You can also see that the pistil in the middle is a collection of several carpels, each of which has this weirdly shaped stigma on it. And this central pistil is going to be what enlarges to give us the capsule that we'll talk about um, momentarily. Um, so flowers with many anthers. A use of the poppies. Um, poppies have edible seeds. And if you've ever had a poppy seed muffin or poppy seed pastries like this bread here, um, then you probably have discovered that it is delicious. Um, the seeds are also used in um, Indian or South Asian cooking more generally. Um, I think this is a Bangladeshi curry, if I recall uh, correctly, that includes poppy seeds. It gives a sort of nutty flavor. Um, while the poppy seeds are delicious, um, there are sometimes concerns expressed that they contain trace amounts of opiates. Even though the amount of opiates is small, it is within the realm of what can be detected by um, blood tests. And so this is important. Um, there's stories about athletes, for example, testing positive for uh, banned narcotics because of eating poppy seeds. I'm not sure if those stories are apocryphal or true, but it is certainly true that there are some countries that have strict limits and might test you upon arrival in the country, and you might find yourself in trouble if you were eating poppy seeds within a day on the way to that nation. So enjoy poppy seeds. They are harmless, but only do it when you are in a relatively safe uh, Western democracy. Um, so we do use poppies, as I've alluded to, for various uh, pharmaceutical and drug purposes. And so poppies include um, opioids, and opioids are chemicals that we are going to use for pain relief. Poppies produce latex, and you should know the term latex. Latex refers to any milky, sticky, defensive fluid that comes from plants. And so Another example of latex is the latex we would get from rubber plants that we would use to make things like latex gloves. And so that's, that's where the name latex comes from, in latex gloves. Um, the properties of latex varies widely among different groups of plants, but in the poppy family, latex contains morphine, codeine, and other opiates. Um, and the opiates in the latex from poppies can be chemically modified to form heroin. So, as I said here, this is a capsule. This is that weird center pistil of the flower once it develops into a fruit. And you can see that by cutting it with a knife, you can get latex to come out. And this is how latex would be collected if this was being used to collect opiates. Um, so just remember, I said this, but I'm going to emphasize it. All latex is a milky, sticky, defensive fluid, but latex from other groups of plants that aren't poppies would not typically contain morphine, codeine, or other opiates. These are characteristics that are particular to the poppies. So I'm getting tired just thinking about this, but... Um, one ethnobotanical use of poppies is that they cause drowsiness. And you can see this in the name Papaver somniferum. So um, we're going to talk for a minute about what scientific names are and how to interpret them. We've seen them um, at several points throughout the course. A scientific name is always two words long. The first word is always capitalized, and it is the name of the genus. A genus is a group of closely related species. For example, in the Papaver genus, there are about 100 species of poppy. So this word tells us the genus, but in this case, if we had only the word Papaver, it would only get us down to a group of 100 species, and the reader wouldn't know which of those species we were talking about. So now we have the word 
somniferum. This is always going to be an adjective. It will always be lowercase, and it's going to describe which of the members of this group we're talking about. So these two words together are going to refer to one single species. And this word is always descriptive, the second word. In this case, the second word is somniferum, which means inducing sleep. And my eyes will close as we talk about that. So it's called this because one characteristic of um, poppy latex is that it causes sleepiness. Um, and just to make that clear then, papaver somniferum is the poppy known to induce sleep. Um, if you are familiar with classic cinema, specifically The Wizard of Oz, then you probably remember the scene where Dorothy is walking through a poppy field. And I'm going to see if we can transition to that and watch an excerpt from it. So this is the Wicked Witch, and she is about to make a concoction in the hopes of trapping Dorothy and stopping Dorothy from reaching the wizard. So obviously we have a large field of poppies here, and you would find this in areas where poppies are being grown for poppy seed, for example. And unknown to uh, the uh, travelers, they're about to enter this field. We're going to skip ahead. And they see the Emerald City. They admire it, but they try to cross the field, and of course, as they try to cross the field... Oh, what's happening? What is it? I can't run anymore. I'm so sleepy. Here, give us your hands and we'll pull you along. Oh, no, please. I have to rest for just a minute. Toto, where's Toto? Oh, you can't rest now. We're nearly there. <laughs> So, a very sad moment. Spoiler alert, they do make it to the castle in the end. That was our entertainment excerpt for today's lecture. We're now going to go back to our discussion. Um, we've been talking about poppies, but we're going to move on to the next family. Um, the next family is also one, incidentally, that uh, figures importantly in the arts and literature. We're going to stick to the botany for this family. So this is the Rose family. And one thing I want you to learn is that the Rose family includes far more than the plants we would traditionally call roses. Um, it's a very diverse family, and we'll see that it includes um, shrubs and trees, as well as things like rose bushes. Some common flower traits for the Rose family, we will find there's almost always five petals, and again, like the poppies, there are many anthers. In many other uh, eudicot families, there would only be five or ten anthers, for example. Um, another uniting feature of the rose family is the hypanthium. We've talked about the hypanthium before. Remember, a hypanthium is a cup-shaped elongation of the receptacle. So it's not really sepals because it also connects to the petals, it also connects to the anthers. It's really as if this little bit of tissue elongated up here, and now the anthers are connecting up here instead of down here. Same goes for the petals, and same goes for the sepals. So there are a few other groups that have hypanthium, but they are really very pronounced in roses, and it's typically where a student would first encounter them. So I've told you that a common characteristic of the rose family is that there should be five petals. You might be thinking that doesn't agree with what you've seen, because when we picture a rose, we're picturing something usually with many petals. So why is this? It turns out that natural roses typically do have five petals. This rose that we are looking at here is the um, Carolina rose, 
or Rosa carolinia, and so it is native to um, to where I'm currently lecturing from. Um, and you can see five petals, and even more pronounced than that strawberry, there are dozens of anthers here, all of these yellow structures. Um, the pistil is less obvious in the center of the flower. So if this is what a wild rose looks like with five petals, then let's think about what's happened with cultivated roses. Obviously, what we're seeing here are many, many petals. In fact, so many that we can't even see into the anthers or the pistil that must be at the center of this flower. So for cultivated roses, what we've done is look for oddballs. Look for ones that have mutations where instead of forming an anther, by mistake, the flower instead forms a petal. Because we find that aesthetically pleasing to look at, in other words, it's attractive, we then keep those plants, we keep their seeds, and we use those seeds to grow new plants, or we use something called cuttings. We just um, cut the stems and apply some hormones to it to create new plants. And so those new plants are going to keep these mutated flowers. So I hate to break it to you, but really rose flowers with many petals are mutants. They're just mutants that we happen to like looking at. So that's all we're going to say about traditional roses. The rose genus, Rosa, is of course a member of the rose family, but there's also many other members. We've already seen that strawberry is a member. All of the members of the stone fruits are also members of the rose family. So things that we typically call stone fruits include cherries, pictured over here, peaches, of course, um, pictured here, and then plums and apricots, which I haven't pictured. But all of those fruits where they have a lot of flesh, and then when you get to the center, there's one hard seed. Many, many of those are in the rose family. I'm only thinking of a couple of exceptions to that rule. The rose family also includes apples and pears. So it might be hard to tell that. We could see it from an apple flower. The apple flower would look pretty similar to um, that strawberry flower we looked at back here. Not exactly the same, but it would have similarities. What we can see though with the apple fruit itself is some remnants of the apple flower. Specifically, when you cut through an apple fruit, you will find this hard dividing line somewhere in near the seeds. And when you bite into it, it might get stuck in your teeth. It's not going to feel as pleasant as the flesh out here. And that's how you'll know you're biting into it. This line that you see is actually the line around the ovary. So back when this was a flower, it would have been flipped upside down and the flower would be sitting up here. And this would have been the ovary and the pistil in the middle of the flower with the ovules inside. As the flower ripens into a fruit, the fruit gets heavy, and so the whole flower flops over. So what used to be the top of the flower is down here um, because it has flopped downward. The ovules have developed into seeds. The ovary has developed into a hard structure around the seeds. All of this flesh, then, is really developing from the tissue that used to be at the base of the flower. And since this is in the rose family, that tissue was hypanthium. So when you eat an apple, you're basically eating the hypanthium of the flower. You can see a bunch of little parts up here. These are probably the styles that are left over from when this was a flower, um, and they just haven't fully fallen off. Some other members of the rose family, um, Several other fruits that we eat are also members. That's going to include raspberries and strawberries and blackberries. And I left the cherry in this picture as well, which we've already talked about. And both raspberries and blackberries have this sort of unusual look where there are several sub subsections that can kind of come apart if you pull at them. In these cases, these flowers had multiple carpels that were not tightly attached to each other and each carpel forms its own little fleshy fruit, 
which are loosely attached to form the entire fruit. So that's true for the raspberry and blackberry. Something kind of similar is happening over here for the strawberry. You can see each of these little yellow spots. Each little yellow spot is one carpel, and this one spot is the seed along with its protective fruit coating. Um, so they're not exactly seeds, but they're seeds with um, a hard, dry fruit over them. And then all of this red, fleshy fruit that has formed between the seeds, that's again an um, expansion of the hypanthium that would have been the cup-shaped structure at the bottom of this flower. It's just grown out and up and in between each of the carpels to form the fleshy fruit. We'll talk about one last edible member of the rose family, since we are on a food theme, and this is almonds. Um, and now you might not recognize the similarity between almonds and the other fruits we've been talking about. But the first thing I'll show you is that there is this fleshy coating on the outside of the almonds. Um, it eventually dries out, but this is um, similar in origin to the fleshy outer layer on a peach or on a cherry. Now if you imagine biting through a peach and getting down to the pit in the middle, then what you would see is something that looks very much like the outside of the nut on an almond. So really it's basically the same structure. It's just that with the peach we would never, we don't typically split open this um, inner hard layer to get at the seed, um, while in almonds we always do. And if you want some evidence that almonds are a member of the rose family, take a look at this flower. Again, you should be able to see three things that hint at the rose family. Five petals, many anthers, and harder to see, but you can kind of see that there's a cup-like depression here, and the petals are attached, and the anthers are attached around the top of that cup. So we can't see down below, but we can infer there's probably a hypanthium down here. We're going to move on now to the third family we will talk about for today. And this third family was out on that other large branch of the eudicots. This is the carrot family. Um, and we'll give it another name as we go. So in the carrot family, um, the flowers are always small. This is not one flower. This is a collection of probably hundreds of flowers. Here's maybe one and one and one then a whole bunch of smaller ones, maybe a dozen or so right here. So in the carrot family, large flowers have shrunk down to really small sides, sizes, but now they're really close to each other, such that the entire group of flowers is the floral display that's going to attract the pollinator to fly over and see what's going on. And you can see that this floral display has an umbrella-like shape to it. So we call it an umbel. The word umbel is right here. We should specify that any group of flowers is termed an inflorescence. And that word is right here. It just refers to a group of flowers growing together um, on the stem. So this particular shape of inflorescence, because it looks like an umbrella, is called an umbel. And based on this, the other name for the family is the umbellifery. Um, this saying it's the family whose flowers are in the shape of an umbel. And I'm just going to fix the spelling here. Let's make that an A-E instead of an E-A. And we'll go on. So carrots obviously are an edible member of the carrot family. The carrot family, interestingly, includes several edible members, especially things that have strong flavors that we use as herbs or spices. So some edible members of this family include carrot, which we've talked about, celery, parsnip, which is a little bit less common in America, but very common in England and Canada, 
Um, it's a vegetable that looks fairly similar to a carrot. Um, then we are more familiar with things like parsley and dill and cilantro. I'll add that to our list. As well as cumin and coriander, fennel, and the list goes on. So all of those things are pretty delicious um, and certainly edible. However, this family also includes several toxic members, including things like wild parsnip and um, water hemlock, hemlock. Wild parsnip is interesting because it's literally the same species as our edible parsnip. It's just that if you leave it alone in the wild, then after a few generations, it evolves defenses of toxic compounds to deter things from eating it. If you start growing it and you select the ones with fewer toxic compounds, then you can get back to something that is edible, like our garden parsnip. So I want to point out the similarities here. This is wild carrot. This is literally just carrot that you would grow in your garden that after a few generations grows in meadows um, sort of naturally. When it is growing in the garden, we call it carrot. When it's growing out in meadows, we typically call it Queen Anne's lace because it looks like a lacy pattern. And there are stories about these two red flowers in the middle um, resulting from Queen Anne pricking her finger and a couple of drops of blood falling onto the center of the lace she was um, working to sew. So that's Queen Anne's lace. What I want to contrast that with here is water hemlock. Um, water hemlock, remember, is a very poisonous plant. A relative of the species is what was used to kill Socrates when he was sentenced to death for, um, for being a difficult person, basically, in Athens. So water hemlock, Queen Anne's lace, water hemlock. They look very similar to each other. That means that if you do try to wild harvest anything from this family, you need to make sure that you know what you're doing, otherwise you would risk accidentally poisoning yourself. So that ends our brief tour of the eudicots. Remember that we've discussed only a tiny fraction of the families. There are somewhere in the general ballpark of 300 families. We talked about three of them here. There are three important ones, but that still means we covered about 1%. So if you continue to study botany, you can learn a lot more about the other 99%. Next, I'll point out that the eudicots include a whole bunch of different growth forms. They include herbs, which don't do secondary growth um, and don't make wood. They include shrubs and trees, which both do, as well as vines. Eudicots occur throughout the world. I, it's safe to say they occur on every continent except Antarctica, and they are the most diverse group of flowering plants as a whole. So there's more species of eudicots than monocots. There's more species of eudicots than basal angiosperms. Now, remember that in the monocots, the grains were super important as a food item for us in terms of calories. So that's still true. The eudicots are probably not as important in terms of calories, but they do give us most of the fruits and vegetables as well as most of the nuts and seeds. So most fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds that you would encounter in the supermarket would be members of the eudicot group. So we have now completed a tour all the way from the um, algae that first gave us terrestrial plants, through the bryophytes, through the ferns and lycophytes, through the gymnosperms, and through the three major lineages of angiosperms. We still have a lot about plants to talk about, such as how do they acquire their energy, um, how do they grow and develop, what controls um, things like their size and shape, and even things like how do they move. We also still need to talk about how do humans use plants, how did we learn to cultivate them in agriculture, and what are some questions that we are now grappling with 
with future directions in agriculture. All of that will be coming up in the next sections of this course.